Okay, welcome to Pong part two, the tutorial. And uh, in the first part, we just to recap, we basically set up the paddles, we set up the ball, and we set up the end zones of red and green so that we had scoring end zones. Um, and now we need to, to get the ball moving and we need to keep track of score. So those are gonna be the focuses for part two of this tutorial. Congratulations if you made it this far. Okay, so we're gonna start on the ball and we're going to add some script to the ball so we can get it moving. And again, we will go with the event when the check, when the uh, green flag is clicked, what's gonna happen to the ball. All right, so we could set the size of the ball. Um, I like to do this for each sprite just because it's a little bit more precise than growing or shrink shrinking a sprite. So we could say set it to 45%. Uh, just to take a look to see what that does. And I'm happy with that ball size. And, and one of the reasons why we want that there is because if we do have a second round where the ball is smaller um, to make it more difficult, then that's an easy block we can adjust rather than trying to click the grow and the shrink directly. So we have the size set and we are now going to create some variables. And uh, variables are like you've had in math, like X and Y. Uh, where you might let x equal 5. Um, it's an unknown amount that you can assign different values to. So we are going to create a variable, and uh, we're going to create the first variable as player1score. And we're going to make it for all sprites, not just for this one. And there we can see it automatically dumps it in the top left-hand corner of the screen, and it's set to 0 by default. Let's make another one computer score and that's okay all right some other variables that i might need um let's make a variable called first round now what i'm actually doing with this one the idea behind this is the program doesn't really know if the player one for example has scored enough points for it to go to the second round we have to tell the computer uh, when that's going to happen. For now, I don't really want the first round to be even um, on the screen. That's something that's going to operate in the background. And we're going to say eventually that whoever scores five first, five points, is going to win round one. And then the game's either over if the computer wins round one, or it goes to round two, which gets harder if the player wins round one. So that's the idea behind this. Let's put the player one score over here and the computer score over here. Okay. So the computer is on this side trying to get points by getting into the red and the player one's on this side trying to get points by getting it into the green. That's the idea. When we click the, the green flag, nothing's happening. So we might want to uh, next go and decide where the ball is starting. So we set it to a size. Now we need to give it motion. We need it to say to go to a specific spot. And here, um, the ideal spot is probably in the very middle, which you might remember from the first tutorial would be represented by zero and zero. So if I run the flag now, it sets it directly to the center. Nothing else has happened yet. Okay. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to create some motion for the ball. And let's just take a look at some of the control statements that we could do here. I could just put forever, and I could just get it to do motion forever. Um, for example, I could get it to move. I could get it to move however many steps at a time I want it to move. Now, the more steps you put in, the faster this ball is going to travel. If I run this right now, there you can see uh, it's moving 10 steps by default to the right on the x-axis, and it's doing that forever. You can see what's interesting here is the yellow is saying that it's continuously doing that. Um, so I want it to move like that, but I don't want it to move and then just hit the side, and I also don't want it to move straight across. So I might actually point this in a different direction. This is another motion. And I'm going to do point in direction. Let's stop this. Um, let's try a negative 45 degree angle on this. 
and we'll go ahead and run this again. And now you can see, boom, it went uh, diagonally, which I'd rather it do, but it gets stuck once it hits a wall and it just stays there. So we're going to need another command that says if on edge bounce. Okay. And now you can see the ball is now traveling. We've made big progress. The ball is reacting as it should in Pawn by going off of different walls and uh, moving in the direction accordingly like a ball would. We have a couple problems though. We are not scoring any points and we are not uh, actually um, able to hit the ball with the paddles. Partly because the paddles currently can't move. So that is a problem. Let's go to the paddle commands and let's try to adjust it so that the paddles can move. All right, so when clicked, and I might actually just um, set up a whole different event here. Sometimes it's nice to just separate your code a little bit. I know this one's telling it to go to the front or the center, or sorry, off to the side. Um, this one, I wanted to keep track of the motion for it. So you can have as many of these like when flags are clicked as you want. It's not gonna make a difference. I'm gonna use a control again. I'm gonna say forever. Uh, and this again is the paddle that the player is responsible for. It's not the computer paddle. Um, and I'm gonna say forever motion. What I want you to do is I want you to go to, now let me find that command again. Go to, go to, there it is. Okay, so go to X uh, 205, which is the same as this, where it already is. So it's basically going to stay on that X value of 205, which will keep it, if you picture a line, if you picture this as the line being 205, it's going to keep it on that platform. And I wanted to adjust, I'm going to allow the user to control this paddle by using the mouse and specifically the, the scroll wheel if they want to. Um, so what we're going to do is put in the mouse Y position. So here I'm just switching over to sensing and I'm looking at the mouse Y position here. I'm going to throw that into the, instead of having a fixed Y coordinate, I'm going to throw that into the Y coordinate. So it's always going to look for the mouse. And now if I run this, you can see I'm actually using the mouse to move this paddle. Um, and it's not really doing anything yet because it's going through it. It doesn't understand that it's a separate object. We haven't asked it to do anything, but at least now we have the motion of the player one paddle and that seems to be correct. So let's take us over now to the computer paddle because um, it's going to have a slightly different code. Right now we have the size set. We have the um, coordinate set of where it goes to and I'm going to say repeat or control uh, maybe forever for now. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a motion that lets us glide. Um, okay, so we're trying to give the computer paddle um, an automated response. We want it to glide towards the ball, basically, um, and try to catch up to it and hit it back to us. So we're going to glide for... And this is where it gets interesting, and this is what this game's really about. How quickly can the computer go before they go so quickly that they can never lose this game? We don't really know. But I'm going to try uh, to not even do a full second at this point. I'm going to do 0.4 of a second to the coordinate of x, negative 210, which is where it's at right now, this imaginary line. And Y, I'm going to get it to go towards the uh, Y position of the ball. So just taking a look for, here it is. So we're going to put this into here. And we're going to say, because the X is a fixed spot, but the Y is the Y position of the ball. And that's what we're taking a look now. So if I run this now, you'll see um, that the computer paddle is trying its best to catch up with the ball. Now clearly, it's not always doing that, but let's take a look at what would happen if I change this to allowing it to go faster, if it goes three seconds towards that position. Okay, oh, sorry, that would be slower, which makes sense. If it's taking three seconds instead of 0.4 seconds, then it's taking a really long time to get there. And if it takes, for example, 10 seconds, then you can imagine it's barely moving at all towards the ball. It has basically no chance of winning this game. 
what if we go down to 0.1 or a tenth of a second and take a look at that? There you can see um, it's staying with it very well. It's hit it both times so far. So it is possible that 0.1 is going to be uh, impossible to beat the computer, but we don't really know that yet. So let's go back to the 0.4 because I was happy with that. It seemed like it did get to the ball sometimes, but not always. And this might be a good pace for round one of this game. The computer might win sometimes, and the player might win sometimes, which is basically what we're trying to accomplish in round one. We're going to go back now to the um, ball physics here, and we're trying to get this now so that it bounces off the paddle. And that might be where we stop with the second tutorial. If we have that much working and maybe some points being scored, then we're going to be happy with that. Okay, so we have a uh, basic movement here, and now we have to keep track of the score so we know how long this is going to go. So what we need at this point is more control. We need an if statement, which you should have seen in code.org. And we're going to say if, um, we'll go to our data here, if the player one score is, and we're going to need a, an operator here too. So you can see we have different mathematical operators here, and we're going to use the less than. And uh, I'm actually going to watch for two different things. So until I pull that out, I'm going to pull in two different operators. Basically what I wanted to say, I'm trying to explain this best I can here, is that if the player one score is less than five, or less than six, we'll say, so that it actually goes until it gets to five. If the player one score is less than six, or the computer score is less than six, then we're still in a round one. So we need a way to keep track of that. The ball movement, all this stuff has to be caught up in that. Okay, so another operator, um, greater than, less than, equal to. You should have seen these in math before. And we're actually going to have two of these uh, side by side. So in the data section, if the player one score is less than six, okay, that means it could be five, four, three, two, one, or zero, and the code in that if statement is still going to activate. Or if uh, the player, the computer score is less than six, then run what's inside this code. Okay, so basically do what's happening here as long as nobody uh, has got to five. Okay, uh, that will then kick it out of that loop. Okay, so now we need some things to keep track of whether or not it has hit the end zones. So we need some more if statements. And this one here, there's a few ways you could do this, but I think the color, if touching color, is probably the easiest thing to do. So if we throw this in, and we have another kind of sensing, um, in this case, if we're touching a color, and that color we want to specify is the exact color that we used. So here, if that color happens to be red, then what do we want to do? What does that actually mean if the ball, because keep in mind we're under the script of the ball right now, if it touches red, that just means that the computer scored a point. So we need to change something about our variable here. We need to change the computer score. Oops, I'm not sure why it's running on me now, but we need to change the computer score by one. Now, let's take a look at what this does, because this is interesting. If we run this code right now, you can see it's already at computer score 7, and then it just got to 14. And I'll let you think about that for a minute. But what, it's going up by 7 every time. Now, maybe you just thought that the reason that's happening is because it's actually touching the color red for many different moments, and it's adding one to the score for every split second that it's there. So the computer, again, stupid computer, I've told you that from the start, it doesn't really understand what I'm trying to do here. I want it to touch the red once, and I want it to stop and give it a point. So i got to say that, or else it's just not going to do that. The other thing is, like every time I retest this game, the computer score is now at 72. 
I don't want that. So I'm going to need to do something to my variables here at the start. I'm going to need to set my variables after I click the green flag. Computer score should always go back to zero. And what else? Uh, I'd probably also want the player one score to go to zero. That way when you press stop and you press start, you're going back to zero every time. So I have that problem fixed, but it's still going up by seven at a time, and I want to fix that. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do to fix it is I'm going to say, well, okay, after you touch the red, give it a point, and then immediately go back to the center so that you don't continuously touch the red over and over. So we're going to add a motion, as we understand, and we're going to say to go to x equals 0, y equals 0. Okay, so now let's take a look at that code. Stop it, start it. It's at zero right now, and when it hits the red, boom, back to the middle. Okay, and big progress here. Save your work, stop it, save your work if you got this far. That's huge progress. The computer is now accurately keeping track of the computer score at least. Okay, now we might want some kind of message here. Um, Rather than the ball just kind of taking off immediately, which is kind of annoying, we might want to say something like, uh, let's try this, say uh, press space to continue. We'll leave that up for two seconds. And then we actually need a control of some sort, um, a wait until. And what are we waiting for? We're waiting for a sensing. Sensing from the user, the space key is pressed. So what I've just told the computer to do in this code is go back to the middle, give the user some kind of idea of what we're waiting for, and then wait till the user presses that key before you launch the next step of the program. So here we go. This should now hopefully stop on the red, back to the middle, and now we've got a message for the user, and we're waiting for space. I'm now actually going to hit space. And you can see we're back to our loop and we've made huge progress again. Okay, anytime you make huge progress, file save. Okay, I think because I'm over the 15 minute mark now on tutorial number two, I'm gonna stop again. And uh, when we come back in tutorial number three, I'm gonna show you how to continue with that so that we have the player one score working and also uh, keeping track of points for player one. So that's coming up. Thanks for watching tutorial two and we'll see you in tutorial three.